be talking about how to build soil health here in Virginia and uh, focusing on organic practices and also um, putting a little bit of attention to um, how it helps uh, water quality. So um, that's because we all share, or many of us are in the um, Chesapeake Bay watershed. And uh, this webinar is supported through a grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation uh, to Virginia Tech with uh, Virginia Association for Biological Farming as uh, one of the subawardees. And so I really appreciate this opportunity to, to talk with you about these topics. And <clears throat> I just want to first acknowledge that a lot of what I'm sharing with you is based on work that I've been doing with the Organic Farming Research Foundation over the past five years, um, analyzing organic research outcomes and boiling them down into practical guidelines for farmers and for uh, service providers. A series of nine uh, soil health guides have been published by OFRF uh, available at their website. And <clears throat> there's, as you see, the, the, um, the covers to the actual publications and there's three more that came out since then. And um, I also wanted to um, just say that this is an excellent source of information on a wide range of topics uh, for organic agriculture. Uh, so what is soil health? Uh, the uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service has a very succinct and yet thorough definition. Uh, it's shown here. Uh, oh, one other thing I wanted to say is uh, there's an awful lot of material in this presentation. I will not be able to really cover all of it. So you will all receive not only a PDF uh, copy of the slides themselves that you could look at at your leisure, but uh, some fairly in-depth presentation notes. Uh, I'm sure there's many points that I will uh, skip over as we go through this, but I will do my best to cover the high points. <clears throat> so soil health as uh, shown here is the soil's capacity to support all of life, plants, animals, and humans uh, as part of a functioning uh, vital ecosystem. Uh, some of the functions of a healthy living soil, there can be roughly organized into physical, chemical, and biological aspects of soil health. Um, overall, what we see um, from the top is that it sustains plant and animal health and it builds resilience. Uh, the farm is able to, sus to sustain stable yields through thick and thin, uh, even through some of the impacts of climate change. <clears throat> and there's some specific physical aspects of soil health. Um, a healthy soil has an open porous structure so that water infiltrates easily and yet the smaller pores hold lots of moisture uh, so that plants, the roots will have both enough air and enough moisture to function fully and they can grow deep and wide. So you have a plant supported by a really vigorous root system. Um, one of the, one of the uh, positive aspects of this is that it protects water quality and uh, the biological side of soil health. Uh, you can see on the right is a very vibrant uh, community of soil organisms, a lot of them in direct association with plant roots, the mycorrhizae fungi and various bacteria that live within and near the root zone uh, or the rhizosphere. And they uh, it's the soil life that breaks down all the fresh residues into organic matter, and <clears throat> they help retain and deliver plant nutrients. A combination of the good water relations and the soil life keeps the nutrients where you want it, right in the root zone where plants can access them when needed, and that they don't wash out and uh, get into the groundwater or run off and get into surface water in the Chesapeake, etc., uh, one of the aspects of a healthy soil microbiome is that there are a few bad guys out there, but when you have um, healthy soil, the good, the, the beneficial and neutral organisms basically crowd out and sometimes directly suppress many of the plant pathogens. Um, now, I'm going to ask you a little quiz question you just keep in the back of your mind. There is something very important missing in that left-hand picture of a healthy plant growing in a healthy soil. Uh, the answer will come later in the presentation, but just something to think about in the back of your mind. So how do we assess soil health? Um, there are a number of laboratory procedures that are being developed to estimate 
specific aspects of soil health, like your total organic matter, and then there's something called active soil organic matter. And that's the part of the organic matter that is still turning over. Soil life can still use it as food, and in so doing, it releases more nutrients. And that whole process um, also helps keep the soil physical structure. If this process stops anywhere along the way, then um, aggregation is longer maintained and the soil becomes more compactable. So you can see on the left here, um, <clears throat> this diagram shows a relationship between the soil uh, biotic community. It basically digests everything that comes into it, manure, plant residues, root exudates, uh, and the active organic matter, which has been through the cycle once or twice and is still available. And as this occurs, you get some respiration. Some of that carbon goes back into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide, and that releases nutrients to the plant, that mineralization process. And importantly, uh, a significant fraction of the original carbon from all the organic residues becomes stable organic matter, which to a large extent is organic matter that is bound to the soil minerals, the clays and silts especially. And really soil health and soil organic matter are a process. They are not a fixed quantity. Um, so while these quantitative measurements, you know, require sending a, a, a sample to the laboratory and they're not yet widely available, some of these microbial biodiversity are a little bit more involved, a little bit more expensive to get done. Uh, microbial activity can be measured by a simple test of uh, respiration. Uh, you can also track your soil health just by direct field observation. What is the color of the soil? Um, how, is it, how workable is it? Does it have an open structure or does it crust over easily? When you pour water or when it rains, you pour, um, uh, does the water soak in quickly? Uh, if you turn up a shovel full, do you see a lot of visible life, earthworms, small insects, et cetera? And of course, how is the crop doing? If you get a little dry spell, does it wilt right away or does it keep on growing? Those are all signs that indicate soil health. So I'm gonna talk about six principles of soil health management, uh, their scientific basis and some practical applications. And these are the four that uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, NRCS has developed uh, starting about 10 years ago, promoted these four key steps, especially important for cropland soils keeping the soil covered at all times. Uh, that soil on the left with the mulch on it and then the living crops starting to over, it, starting to protect it as well. Um, that protects it from the impact of uh, rainfalls and hot sun, and it keeps the surface open and living. Uh, maintaining living roots. Living roots are the bread and butter of the soil life. Um, a diverse cropping system is so much more is is so much more capable of maintaining a healthy soil microbiome than a monocrop. If that whole field were just in corn or just in soybeans or even just in one of the vegetable crops you see there, you won't have as diverse a community. And you can achieve this either by direct intercropping, by multiple uh, species cover crops, or simply by rotating. If you grow corn this summer, you might grow rye and veg in the winter go to mixed vegetables next summer, and then you feel like when you're doing a field, another field crop, you might go to soybeans or millet. And that diversity um, really enhances uh, soil health. And then minimizing disturbance. And at first when the NRCS advanced these principles, they were focusing on minimizing tillage. And this is a roller crimper taking that huge cover crop down without disturbing a grain of the soil. And if you have a special no-till planter or a strip-till planter, you can get your next crop planted with minimal disturbance. Uh, we'll talk about this a little further um, in a little further in the presentation. So what is one of the key themes here is that the living plant is the farmer's primary tool for building healthy living soil. In fact, the living plant is the source of all organic matter on, on the planet, basically. Um, its foliage protects the soil surface, it keeps it covered, its residues can do the same, but the living roots are what continually build and maintain that tilth or open structure. Um, and that process where some of the carbon remains in the soil, that is sequestering carbon that helps climate. Um, the uh, plant is continually feeding soil life 
And as its roots go deeper, it helps keep the prof soil profile open and deep, which is important for the health of subsequent crops. And you'll notice that three of those four principles directly pertain to living plants. And the fourth pertains to how we manage those living plants that we want to bring to the end of their cycle in order to grow our food crops. So going on, um, the magic of this is that we have this partnership. Plants are continually feeding the soil organisms with goodies like sugars and amino acids, basically stuff that the plant makes through photosynthesis, takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But plants can't live on sun and carbon alone, so they turn to the organism and say, okay, well, um, if you give me enough nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and all the micronutrients, just don't do an NPK, just do all the nutrients, help me get them, I'll keep you fed. And what's, um, there's been some fossil evidence uncovered in the last decade or two that this partnership co-evolved whenever land plants first appeared on the planet. In other words, back 460 million years ago, we had dirt, but we didn't have soil. And it wasn't just the plants, it was their microbial symbionts that had a lot of resemblance to modern mycorrhizal fungi, the fungi that grow into the plant, use a little bit of its energy and then go out into the soil and forage nutrients and moisture. So it's been an amazing partnership ever since um, life came to the land. So, well, in practice, when it comes to cropland, um, soil health, cover crops play a central role, especially in annual crop rotations, but even in perennials. They just do all these different functions. You can see listed here. Of course, they keep the soil, uh, they maintain the soil structure by protecting the surface. They're feeding the soil life, replenishing organic matter, um, and maintaining the soil structure. The legumes fix nitrogen. It's a very important source of nitrogen in all sustainable agricultural systems. And all of them recover and retain nutrients. The deep-rooted co cover crops will bring nutrients up from four or five feet down. So there's three different examples here, right from our own region. On the left is a spring cover crop of mustard, peas, oats, and barley in my own front yard garden, planted in March, photographed in June. In the middle, again, from my garden here in Floyd, uh, that's a mixture of pearl millet, sorghum Sudan, um, and radish. And all three of those crops have incredibly deep root systems. And let's say I'd over applied nitrogen to the preceding crop. I gave the broccoli a little more than it needed. And it started leaching down towards the groundwater. Well, I tell you what, those three cover crops, any one of them could pick up every stray bit of soluble nitrogen down to five feet. Um, on the right is a cover crop of the winter cover crop of triticale, which is a wheat rye cross and Austrian winter field pea, which is one of our best winter legumes in our region, uh, hardy to about zero Fahrenheit. That has five tons per acre of biomass above ground, plus probably two tons below ground and maybe a ton of root exudates during its life cycle. Tremendous amount of organic matter and nitrogen. And Last but absolutely not least, the orchard down there. The more the orchard floor is kept in living cover, um, and it's allowed to grow tall between them, and it's kept much shorter around the trees to minimize competition. But it's very important that orchards and vineyards have um, pretty much year-round vegetation covering the, uh, the soil. Bare soil orchards, whether maintained with herbicides or with tillage, will lose half their organic matter compared to a well-managed um, orchard soil. Uh, here's some excellent resources for cover crops, uh, managing cover crops profitably. This is a Pissari publication. It's been around a long time. Um, and a little more recently, VABF member Pam Dalling has uh, uh, published this book, Sustainable Market Farming. It has a very substantial section and a very informative table on cover crops for our region. Uh, she has been working with cover crops in central Virginia and, is, and we'll talk a little bit more about her, the systems that she has developed. Um, she also has a presentation on cover crops, uh, very much in depth. And she gave a presentation herself in this webinar series a little earlier this year. Uh, third resource, uh, the Southern Cover Crop Council a uh, fairly new organization for our region, but it is developing a lot of great information, including cover crop varieties. There are actually cultivars of cover crops that do better in our region or do better for specific purposes. So getting on to another aspect of the four principles, crop diversity. How does this work? 
if you grow just one type of plant, it will have a certain suite of organisms or soil microbiome associated with its roots. Uh, but that microbiome will perform some, but not all of the desired functions of a healthy soil. So if you have a diverse mix, each one supports a different guild of microbes and it expands the number of functions, nitrogen fixing, also retrieving nitrogen uh, that is leached, uh, the mycorrhizal fungi, many, but not all of those plants in that uh, picture, the buckwheat on the right and the um, radish, the second from the left will not support mycorrhizal fungi, but the grasses and the legume do so very well. Um, all of these participate in disease suppression. They just by uh, supporting various organisms that either increase the crop's capacity to ward off disease, it stimulates immune system, almost like a vaccine is called it induced systemic resistance, or they just crowd out the bad, uh, the undesirable organisms, or they just increase the crop's overall vigor by increasing water and nutrient um, uptake efficiency. And some of them will directly attack the pathogens, they'll just eat them for lunch. So, um, and then another thing is you notice all these plants have different root architecture. Some of them are shallow, some of them are fibrous, some of them are very deep, some of them is a strong tap root. And that complementary structure further enhances uh, soil structure and drainage. So a couple of uh, practical examples of crop diversification on the left, um, that's the ABF member and longtime organic farmer, uh, Charlie Maloney. Uh, Charlie and Miriam Maloney have a uh, 200 member community supported agriculture program. This is his high tunnel. Instead of just sticking the tomatoes in there and hoeing out weeds, he planted spring greens, which are just now getting near harvest ready, um, either before or just at the time that he set out the tomato plant. So just as the tomato plants are taking off, he's going to get a, a, a bunch of greens off of there. Very few weeds had a chance to grow. Um, and that's going to help improve the soil as well by diversifying the uh, soil microbiome. Multi-species cover crop in the center. It's a mixture of buckwheat, uh, cowpea, and sorghum sedan. Um, on the right, this is a theoretical diversified rotation, but basically in seven years, we have four cover crops and three production crops representing uh, six or seven plant families. Uh, this will definitely help uh, overall soil health. Okay, now we're getting on to the use herbicides to kill our cover crops. So the time-honored method is called a legume plow down, and it's great for providing a big burst of nitrogen for the next crop. However, we're burying a lot of the most biologically active topsoil under several inches of soil. Uh, in this case, the farmer has at least set the plow at a good depth so that it is not bringing subsoil up. But what's going to happen is a lot of that organic matter that you built with the cover crop is going to burn up very quickly because of that intense disturbance. And when it's an all legume cover crop, you will actually get an increase in leaching and denitrification. Now, denitrification forms this really potent greenhouse gas called nitrous oxide that is responsible for about half of all of agriculture's direct emissions. Uh, I'm not talking about the indirect emissions that you know result from other aspects of the food system, but just the direct emissions from field operations and, and uh, farm machinery and the soil itself. Um, so there's a number of ways we can lessen this, the intensity of this disturbance. Uh, you can flail, mow the cover crop, and then till it in shallowly. Uh, you see here done with the rototiller, and uh, there are other implements that can make the tillage even gentler. You're still going to have some burning up of organic matter, and if you have a really heavy rain on that surface, you are still going to get some crusting and possible runoff. Uh, taking it a step further, you take a out there with a roller crimper and just um, when the cover crop is in full to late bloom or just beginning to set seed, that's when you can crimp it and pretty much terminate a winter cover crop ahead of the summer season. It's getting too hot for it to grow back anyway. And two approaches. One is to come in with a narrow strip tillage. It's an implement there um, in uh, a slide, the picture F. It works up about a six inch wide swath of the soil, leaving the rest undisturbed and covered by that residue. Or you can go in with a no-till drill or planter, like that you see with that soybean crop. Um, and, and in the lower right, the peanut crop, that came up in a strip-till uh, application. But basically, one thing to remember 
even if you're not disturbing the soil, if you're doing no-till like that field above where the corn residue is lying, there's not much of it left. That was no-till. However, the bare soil itself is at incredible risk. It's losing organic matter. Um, the, the soil life's got a famine going on. They got nothing to eat. There's no, there's no roots, uh, exudates, and the residues are getting thin. And when this occurs, if there is any soluble nitrogen along, um, around, it's going to leach to the ground more the next time you have a good hard rain. Um, and is imminent. Um, the, the residues there are going to help a little bit, but a heavy rain is still going to seal the surface. Uh, that's a level field, so you just get ponding, which is also not great for soil health. But if it was even a 2% slope, you get runoff, um, and uh, the phosphorus is going to say, hello, Chesapeake and uh, cause some more trouble there. And when soil is sitting idle like this, it is losing organic matter and it's moisture holding capacity and structure every day. And your production costs are gonna go up. So cover the soil with anything. Even a plastic tarp or film mulch is better than nothing because it will protect it from the raindrop impact and will reduce erosion except if you have the mulch on beds and there's alleys between and they're sloping, they will suffer severe erosion. A um, little better is landscape fabric, which is porous. It also breathes and lets the moisture in, uh, but really it's better to have living plants. That's really the best. Or second best is a residue or organic mulch. Um, both of those situations much more simulate nature in terms of keeping the soil covered. Well, here's a really cool thing you can do. Instead of saying, okay, wait till harvest, till in the residue and the weeds and plant the cover crop and oops, it's too late. We planted in November and we had a hard freeze and the cover crop didn't come up till February. That's one of the challenges of cover cropping when you have a long season crop. So there's a number of ways you can get around this. One thing I really love is um, interplanting or overseeding or interseeding. You plant the cover crop either with your production crop or you seed it into the production crop when it is established, but not too large and, and uh, neither, neither too small nor too large. That first example on the right was right here in Virginia. It's William Hale's farm um, in central Virginia. He makes compost, he grows cover crop seeds. Right there, he's growing rye to harvest for seed to sell to other farmers to plant a rye cover crop. And he said, well, why not throw some clover seed in with it? So the clover came up as an understory, didn't interfere with harvest, but it's covered the ground. So you have this nice balance of nitrogen fixing clover and very carbon rich, nitrogen poor uh, rye residue that will remain after he's run the combine. Uh, second example is from Alabama, but has also been done successfully in Virginia, fall brassicas, here's broccoli crop. Um, in this case, it's a self-seeding crop of crimson clover. The last crop was allowed to form seeds, which stayed dormant through the blistering hot summer and came up as an understory in the fall broccoli. So instead of broccoli and weeds, you got broccoli and clover. Um, an example in the lower left, uh, that was done in Vermont. If you could do it in Vermont, you could do it in Virginia. The um, Elliot Coleman was growing sweet corn. And when the sweet corn was up and maybe knee high, he went with a little push seeder and drilled two rows of forage soybeans, which now that the sweet clover, the uh, sweet corn is harvested and spent, the soybeans are, are growing full tilt and will grow until frost. Uh, on the right, a couple of examples from uh, out west, uh, but still applicable here, that is winter squash that was under seeded with red clover uh, just before the vines ran. Uh, turns out we want to use warmer, uh, warm season legumes or buckwheat in our applications because the clovers tend to burn out in the hot summers here in Virginia. Uh, lower right, that is um, those dead residues or eggplant that have long since uh, finished producing and been killed by frost. And that's oats that were, on, uh, that were seeded into the stand of eggplant. So there are two more principles. I said six principles. We've been talking about four. The fifth one is integrating livestock into your cropping system. They bring a whole new dimension of diversity. And to be perfectly fair, NRCS did not at all neglect livestock. They consider it part of their diversity principle. So that could say diversity crops and livestock in your or diversify your production system. I like to think of it as a fifth um, principle because it has such unique and dramatic effects on the soil's ability to sequester and hold carbon. And when you bring livestock into your system and manage them carefully, 
You enhance within farm nutrient cycling, reduce your dependence on purchased fertilizers, and when done skillfully, greatly reduce the impacts of your nutrients on both water quality and climate. So in practice, this looks like the livestock pictures on the left are taken at uh, Elmwood Stock Farm, uh, which is in Kentucky. Um, they have a 200, no, excuse me, 800 member CSA. They have several hundred acres of farmland, uh, about 200 in a crop livestock rotation where they grow vegetables intensively for three years with winter cover crops and a fair amount of tillage. Yeah, they do till, uh, but when uh, at once a year. Uh, when that's done, they plant a perennial sod for the livestock to ro be rotationally grazed on. And that um, remains for five years and completely rebuilds the soil from the impacts of that tillage and intensive production. Excellent nutrient cycling. And what this does is it greatly reduces the amount of nitrogen that's going to go to groundwater and the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium that's going to run off into our surface waters. Um, and studies by the University of Kentucky show that this system is really excellent at restoring soil health back to that which you see in the permanent pasture, which all of their steeper land is in permanent pasture. And after that five-year uh, grazing period, it has been fully restored. Um, one of the things is there's a huge difference between well-managed grazing and poorly managed grazing in its impacts. When an area is continuously grazed, even at a moderate stocking density, the plants don't have a chance to grow back. And it's a lot like a lawn that's kept manicured and you have very shallow roots and your soil organic matter is gonna be so in that loss. You can find pastures with low organic matter. And in those situations, all the nitrogen that the cattle scatter through manure and urine is bound to head for the groundwater. But when instead you have intensive rotational grazing where you have a high number, a very high stocking rate for just a day or two days, chewing that down and then stomping down the old coarser stems that they don't care to eat. And then you take them out and let that whole field recover for a sufficient time, which is anywhere from one to two months, depending on season, soil type, climate, et cetera. Um, you get a situation where the, um, the sod, the forage is incredibly healthy, therefore more nourishing. Its roots go down five or 10 feet. They pick up all the nutrients and the roots are being continually regenerated and then briefly shocked. When that shock occurs, they slough a lot of organic matter into the soil, which a lot of which becomes stabilized. This process can build organic matter at up to two tons per acre annually until it reaches the um, level which occurred under the native forest or uh, prairie ecosystem that was there before farming was ever done. Another thing about rotational grazing is you're distributing the manure more evenly. And again, that's protecting water quality, both groundwater and uh, the, uh, the watershed. There is a sixth principle. And in a way, it's the first. It's the oldest. It's called the law of return, uh, which is how Sir Albert Howard, one of the pioneers of organic agriculture, described it way back in the um, uh, mid-1900s, almost 100 years ago. And what he realized is that in addition to returning nutrients to the soil, we need to return and replenish organic matter. And back then, the focus was on getting manure and compost and residues back onto the land. Um, it's interesting to look at this because at the same time, uh, conventional agriculture of the mid 20th century was saying, well, look, we know that crops usually run out of nitrogen, phosphorus and or potassium when this Soil has been cropped hard and hasn't had a chance to be replenished. So let's just take these convenient bags of uh, salt, uh, soluble fertilizers and return it at rates that we think will sustain crop productivity. Um, and in practice, um, it has been found that the law of return means replenishing the soil, both in terms of organic matter and in terms of nutrients. Uh, and in fact, in a recent uh, forum, uh, Chris Lawrence, who I believe is on this webinar, uh, is participating. He said, we must take, we take from the soil through tillage and harvest, and we must give back more than we take. And it is now widely recognized throughout mainstream agriculture that replenishing the organic matter through the living plant and through returning uh, farm residues like manure, 
uh, either to directly or after composting, uh, which is a good way to stabilize it and build up beneficial organisms, um, is vitally important. So, well, let's see how this looks in organic uh, applied in organic farming systems. Are there opportunities? There are a few challenges. So the USDA organic standards really has a lot of parallels with those six principles. The one, the two things that stand out that make it a little different from what I would call conservation agriculture or what is commonly called that, uh, which is um, conventional inputs as needed, but with best practices for soil health and for conservation. That's conservation agriculture. Organic takes it, uh, uh, in a different direction in two ways, not using any synthetic substances, which is very important for protecting soil life. Um, it's, uh, I would say that the, the tillage and chemicals, both are significant soil disturbances. We'll get to that a little bit more. So the, the choice in the organic is to first eliminate the chemicals. And therefore, because we're not using ag chemicals, we are using the application of plant and animal materials as a significant part of our fertility program. So these six principles, four of them look very, very similar on a well-managed organic farm and a well-managed conservation agriculture farm that is not using fully organic practices. Where they differ most is how we go about minimizing disturbance and how we practice the law of return. So basically organic agriculture says, okay, no chemicals. Okay, well, when the weeds come in, we're gonna till as needed. And conservation agriculture says, we're sick and tired of our soil blowing away. We're going to sell the tiller and we'll just use the sprayer when we really need it or the fertilizer. So there's some real challenges and really important opportunities in the organic weed approach to weed management. When you don't use herbicides, you have no constraints, basically no chemically related constraints on how diversified and how tight your rotation is. So like if I grow those lima beans and then I want to go into squash and I had used an herbicide in the lima beans that was selective for legumes, I might have to worry about whether it's going to make it hard to plant squash for a while and grow it. Um, but without that concern, you have maximum diversity. There is nothing to interrupt that year-round living root um, other than the time that you, that you actually till to like get a clean seed bed. Otherwise, you've got living root all the time. You don't have to worry about herbicides interfering with the plant's ability to maintain a vigorous root system. Uh, the downside, of course, we all know mechanical cultivation. Um, it does consume organic matter. And on the left, that's a very shallow rolling basket tool. So we're not losing a lot, but it will pulverize the surface. It can promote crusting and erosion. So that's the challenge. And as a result, more farmers and researchers have been looking at organic no-till, which is uh, basically you terminate the cover crop with a roller crimper or a mower or a scythe if you're at a garden level. Tremendous benefits. And then you use a no-till or minimum till system for getting your cover, your uh, production crop planted. So there are some uh, real benefits. Uh, numerous studies have shown that the organic no-till systems, these are farming systems exper uh, experiments, many multi-year trials. When you minimize tillage through this approach to cover crop management and use organic practices, you get the greatest soil organic matter and other parameters of soil health, highest levels of diversity of soil life, best erosion control, and it slows down the release of nitrogen. And if you're in a hot climate like the coastal parts of Virginia or, or the Piedmont and your soil is sandy, that can be a benefit because instead of your cover crop nitrogen washing away in the first rain, you got it available for your crop. Well, there are risks of weed loss, uh, of yield loss, of uh, weeds. That's a big one in our region, uh, especially in areas with cooler climates, uh, starting perhaps here in Appalachia, but certainly in the northern half of the country. You get planting delays and challenges uh, with this system. Slow release in cooler climates can uh, uh, inhibit uh, cro uh, crop yields. Uh, on the right, you see a successful example at Virginia Tech, uh, roll down uh, Ryan Harry Vetch, uh, planting of uh, organic summer squash, which gave yields commensurate with um, slightly above average conventional yields for that crop. Failure in the, uh, failure in the lower right-hand corner is somewhat cooler climate, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, 
The problem there was that I rolled down rye and I planted the, the broccoli and there wasn't enough nitrogen for the broccoli and the weeds got the upper hand. And interestingly enough, when I did rye and vetch in that very same system, I had a decent success. It was almost no weeds and moderately high yields. Um, this system does require tremendous skill uh, and some special equipment for success. Uh, most importantly, you need to have a mature high biomass cover crop. It must be in late flowering or it won't roll crimp. And your weed pressure has to be fairly low and there, you don't want any perennials, no quackgrass, especially not, especially not any Bermuda grass or bindweeds um, or um, Johnson grass, things like that. Um, so let's leave that behind and say, okay, there are other practical ways for reducing tillage intensity. And there is some real research evidence that these make a positive difference. For deep but non-inversion tillage, uh, the spading machine is an excellent implement. Although it can turn a cover crop or even a perennial sod into a good seed bed in one or two passes, it's actually gentler on soil aggregates uh, because of its vertical action. It does not create a plow pan. Uh, and sometimes it does get better yields than plow disc. Um, there are other ways you can actually eliminate a tillage pass. Um, if you're practicing good preventive weed management, which includes rotations, um, is skillfully designed rotations to keep the weeds confused, you can reduce the number of cultivations you need. Sometimes you can use mulch or flame weeder or just mowing instead of actually getting in there and disturbing the soil to knock out the weeds. Uh, if you've got tomatoes three feet high and you get weeds a foot high, you could probably get away with just mowing the, mowing the alleys. Um, another way that we've seen earlier, overseeding cover crops into cash crops, that relay planting, that eliminates that tillage in the transition from cash to cover. Um, chisel plow or at a garden scale, the broad fork is another way to achieve uh, non-inversion deep tillage that breaks through hard pan uh, and helps prevent it from reforming right away. Um, and we'll talk a little more about this later. You can take a rototiller and you can gear it down so that instead of pulverizing the daylights out of your soil surface, it just sort of gently crumbles it. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll get to an example of how that's done. Here's another newer shallow tillage implement. It's a power harrow. And it can be used to make a seed bed, incorporate light residues and amendments. It's good for taking out small weeds. Just disturbs a lot, top couple of inches. And there have been studies that show that if you use shallow tillage or even chisel plow in lieu of plow disc and use good organic practices, these will give you significantly higher populations of desirable soil organisms and more soil organic matter than full conventional tillage. So it's not a black and white all or none thing when it comes to tillage and organic matter and soil health. So here's some more practical examples of strip tillage. Um, the left two pictures of a strip tiller uh, that's quite effective at um, just disturbing maybe a tenth of the surface to get to prepare your planting row. Again, there's that picture we saw earlier. Um, and on the far right um, is a farm right here in, in uh, Floyd, Virginia, a Seven Springs farm. It's a CSA. She just took a small walk behind rototiller through the mowed rye cover crop to create narrow tilled beds for the tomatoes, set the tomatoes out, and left the rye in the rest over the rest of the field mow it once or twice and then as the summer heat built up uh, the rye just ceased to be a problem but it was still suppressing weeds here's another practice that's coming into vogue these days and it's really excellent um, occultation um, a term that was introduced by um, uh, Fortier is a, a farmer up in uh, Quebec who's written an excellent book on market gardening uh, basically you just cover your field uh, mow it, mow the cover crop down or the weeds or whatever that you cover it for about a, a month with this uh, tarp. The best really is a uh, landscape fabric because it'll breathe and allow moisture in. Or you can use silage tarp, which is a heavy duty plastic. Either of these can be used over and over for at least a dozen times before they'll start to fall apart. It's really good for ensuring full termination of a cover crop, especially one that maybe you had to mow a row just roll just a little earlier than optimum late flowering stage. And you can leave it there to keep to block all the weeds in the cover crop regrowth until it's time to plant. And then you pick it up and you can replace it. If you want to continue with this sort of mulching for your crop, you just have planting holes uh, made in the mulch and put that down. Another approach is solarization. Um, Anthony Flacco Vento, who is a grower here in Abington, Virginia, 
he used old high tunnel row cover to solarize soil after he mowed a very high biomass summer cover crop. And not only did it kill the weeds in a couple of days, but it affected termination of the mowed cover crop and it speeded the mineralization of nitrogen from the cowpeas and millet so that he didn't have to add nitrogen fertilizer to get a huge yield of fall cauliflower and broccoli. And since these crops generally need 150 to 200 pounds of nitrogen, that was very interesting. He did say that uh, he would need to tool up to make it practical. Uh, it was just a huge amount of labor doing everything by hand and digging holes for each plant. So that is, um, that is a consideration. You have, to, you have to tool up for it. Okay, here's the other area where organic farmers face both challenges and opportunities. Uh, nutrient management. Um, organic sources are less likely to pollute. Uh, and uh, at the same time, because it's biologically mediated, it is harder to exactly predict when you're going to get the nutrients. So there's a tendency to use quite a bit of compost or manure and or poultry litter to um, make sure you get enough nitrogen and other nutrients. The problem is the balance between nitrogen and phosphorus is not ideal for plant needs. It gives you way more phosphorus than you need. And you can very easily build up excess soil phosphorus, which can suppress mycorrhizal activity. And those are those plant symbiotic fungi that are so vital, both to soil health and plant health. And it can tie up micronutrients, although usually when you're giving your soil lots of um, compost, you're not going to run out of micronutrients, but you can have runoff to the surface waters. And again, we have to be conscious of um, stewardship of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, organic yields are often nitrogen limited when the soil life is depleted, like you have a new field, you haven't built up the soil health yet, or when you have a very high carbon residue, like a rye cover crop or a straw mulch, it can tie up if it's tilled in. Um, and sometimes the nitrogen is just not timed well for the crop. However, it can be easy to overuse organic and it'll add to your costs. And in addition to soluble fertilizers, even concentrated organic fertilizers that release a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus, they will consume some organic matter. Instead of building organic matter, you'll, you'll be losing some and you'll be compromise the soil's health and capacity to cycle nutrients. And you do have some threat to water quality. And here's the Here's the rub, um, and it looks like I'm going to have to speed up because I'm, um, I'm going to have to skip over a few things, but here's the rub. Vegetable crops especially use very little phosphorus relative to nitrogen and potassium. The left column is nitrogen, the middle is phosphorus, pounds per acre removal and an average harvest, and then potassium. Grains and hay will take more phosphorus, but still not very much, and look at what two most common amendments are compost that's typically about one, 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 that's like for a good manure compost. It gives you five times as much phosphorus at a rate that will, will provide the nitrogen or potassium you need. Poultry fertilizers like Harmony 543, uh, similar, very useful when your phosphorus is very low, but once it's up in the optimal range, you wanna to switch to other materials. You can use feather meal for nitrogen, potassium sulfate for, ta for potassium. However, wait a minute, compost is so important because it does build stable organic matter. It enhances soil biodiversity, suppresses crop disease. It has multiple beneficial effects for soil health that complement the effects of the living plant. So what are we gonna do? It's good and it's got a problem with the phosphorus. The good news is that the research has shown that if you use cover crops with your diversified rotation, and just a little bit of compost, just within the constraints of good nutrient management, you put on a rate that's not gonna build up the excess phosphorus, they work together much better than any of those practices alone to build soil health, all of these aspects of soil health, including the delivery of, of um, the cycling and the delivery of plant nutrients. And another thing is um, if you are amending for phosphorus, you can use legumes to uh, fix nitrogen, add, uh, supplement your nitrogen, and deep-rooted crops can, can uh, retrieve reserves of both leached nitrogen and mineral reserves of potassium. They're actually quite abundant in our soils. So why do labs recommend so much NPK? This is an example of Virginia Tech 
uh, this is some years ago, they may have actually changed their uh, protocols for recommendations. But the problem is the soil test looks at the top six inches um, and the assumptions on which these uh, fertilizer recommendations are based. I mean, look at that. We already have enough phosphorus. Why do we want 100 pounds of P205 when our next vegetable crop is only gonna take about 20 of them? Um, and then the potassium as well. The potassium is already way ample. Uh, there's an assumption that soil is leaky so that you're gonna have to add more than you're taking off. And it ignores the capacity of soil life and deep rooted crops to replenish nutrients. There's a very interesting study in a coastal plain soil in South Carolina. This is fairly analogous to what a lot of Virginia growers face out in the coastal plain, very sandy topsoil. Uh, subsoil is actually enriched in clays, uh, but very often generally a fairly low fertility type soil. Uh, this is a five-year rotation trial that he did uh, organically managed on Orangeburg loamy sand, uh, low inherent fertility. He found he didn't need any phosphorus or potassium, and he only needed half of the nitrogen rate to sustain top yields. And that's a result of good organic management. Uh, during this time, the soil organic matter increased a half a point, which is an excellent result. Um, and the soil test nutrient levels were stable. And in Clemson University in a different soil, kind of a slightly wet bottomland had this pretty much the same kind of result. Uh, they grew a mixture of rind, crimson, clover and either roll crimped it or tilled it in. And it was an area that had been under long-term soil um, uh, organic practices. And although this Tocoa Sandy loam is considered natively very low on organic matter, they had built it all the way up to 4.6%. And he tried different rates of nitrogen. Well, the cover crops provided 8,000 pounds of biomass. It's adding organic matter, 130 pounds of nitrogen. And between the soil organic matter and the cover crop residue, the tomatoes and the squash showed no need for nitrogen to be added. So um, input frugality, a couple of ways to do this. Uh, of course, you build your healthy soil, uh, grow legumes for nitrogen, um, Returning on-farm residues to the soil cycles nutrients to crop livestock integration really helps. Be sure to do a soil test and also test your crop foliage. That'll tell you what you really need something. You might have a soil test that has low phosphorus, but the crop's getting plenty if you have biologically active soil. Really useful to conduct a side-by-side -side trial. Say, well, maybe I need feather meal. Maybe I don't need to grow this crop. Well, let's put some on this bed and right next to it on a bed with similar soil, same crop variety go without. Do you see a difference? And do you see a difference in soil conditions? And do the differences pay for your input? Like if your yield went up 5%, but you needed a 20% response to pay for the fertilizer, you can just let it go. So a uh, few health challenges, soil health challenges right here in Virginia. Uh, we're looking at the effects of a warm climate and uh, soil types. Okay, climate change itself is really stressing our soils and increasing production risks related to soil loss. The heavier rains, um, the sudden shifts from flood to drought, it's called a flash drought. Um, hotter summers accelerates uh, the soil organic matter loss and actually directly stress soil life. Uh, so we're faced with a tremendous number of challenges from the climate. Um, all right, so what happens when it pours down too hard? Oh, and by the way, can you see the answer to the question I asked at the beginning of the presentation? Look at that on the left. What was missing is this, uh, this residue on the surface. You need to surface cover. That if, when the plants are young, there's a lot of exposed soil, that rain pours down, the healthiest soil will eventually crust over and become less healthy. But in this circumstance, during the big downpour, uh, the rain soaks in, uh, a lot of it is retained for later use when the, so when the weather gets dry again. Uh, and because of that retention, uh, nutrients are recycled rather than lost to the groundwater. If you have a soil that's compacted on the surface or at a subsurface hard pan, uh, you get much more runoff, uh, you're losing soil you're losing soil organic matter especially, and you're losing your nutrients. And if there is some leaching beyond the reach of those shallow roots where they're getting stopped by that hard pan, that nitrate nitrogen is also lost to your production system. 
You can have soils that are just kind of depleted and low in organic matter. It's easy to happen in sandy soils. You won't get there as much runoff, but the water may not be retained well and it may leach through to the groundwater so quickly that you do lose some nitrogen that way. And looking at it from the through the financial lens, you can see what happens to your to your um, input costs. Are you keeping them on the farm to make profits or are they running away? Here's an example. This was a real wake up call. This is in Floyd. We had um, a period of time in September of 2015 where we had 20 inches of rain in 30 days. Seven of those inches came down on the 29th. Our river was three feet deep over the garden. We had grown potatoes. And one of my community mates, the very day we dug those potatoes in July, came in and planted sorghum Sudan grass, which created this really thick cover about four feet deep. So Here's the flood. Here's the next day. Well, it kind of trashed our fence and it flattened the cover crop, but we had all our soil left. I couldn't imagine what a gully that would have been if we had just dug the potatoes and walked away. So grateful to my community mate, Abel, Abel Duffy, who got that cover crop in. So healthy soil is going to decrease our risk during the vagaries of climate change. You know, we have a bad drought next year. If you have a depleted soil, uh, it will not be as resilient. The crops will suffer, whereas if the yield losses in the really healthy soil will be much less. The same if we have a really bad flood in the future year. And your cost, you can compensate for depleted soil with high inputs. And if you're doing it organically with a high input organic system, you may boost your yields and sales a little bit, but your costs are going to go way high and they completely overtake uh, the benefits. Well, okay, we have another dilemma. You open any organic farming manual and they'll promise you this beautiful, rich, dark, chocolate brown soil if you just take care of it. And you've been diligently doing the best you can for your soil for 20 years and you're on the coastal plain and it's still pale and sandy. You're in the Piedmont and it's still brick red. But what's happening here? You're not doing anything wrong. We have a really long growing season. We have a really hot climate, especially Piedmont and uh, Coastal Plain. I can get our soils to turn pretty good, nice brown up here in Appalachia, but that's cheating because we have a cooler climate and a heavier soil. So it, the warm weather is speeding microbial activity. You're burning up the organic matter almost as soon as you're adding it. The good news is you still have a vibrant soil microbial community. It's just as much good life in those soils as there is in a uh, in a dark brown soil up north. And the other good news is that if you take advantage of that long growing season to maximize your plant biomass, you know, cover crops, intercrops, sod crops, just keep something growing all the time, you're fixing carbon dioxide back in and you will maintain a level of organic matter that is very helpful for your soil and climate. And year around plant cover is essential. So I just want to talk a little bit, we're getting a little bit geeky here. I, uh, I like to get into the technical terms a little bit. Our soils, the dominant soil order is called altisols. And that is just uh, Latin for saying our soils are highly leached, highly weathered, and very old. So they've been sitting under this warm, rainy climate for some unaccountable millions of years. And that has leached a lot of the clays out of the topsoil and deposited them down in the subsoil or bee horizon. So your zone of greatest biological activity near the surface is now separated from your zone of higher clay content, which also has some of your nutrient reserves and your moisture reserves. Uh, and sometimes because it's so intensely leached, our subsoils get very acidic and between the acid and the low organic matter, you will have um, more, you'll have a tendency to a very acidic pH, which can interfere with crop uh, root growth. So in coastal plain soils, we have another challenge very often. Sometimes that leaching process has been so intense that there is a horizon called the E horizon in the middle where you don't have much clay, you don't have much biological activity either. And that soil tends to compact, it gets get very tight. So your plant roots don't grow and your plants cannot access this nutrients and moisture. The only way to sustain yields and drought resilience is to subsoil every year. And that can be rough on the soil health. Um, however, we have uh, studies in South Carolina applicable also in our region 
on a really sandy soils found that if you have a decent cover crop of rye, even a ton or two per acre, its roots go right through that E horizon. The winter moisture has made it penetrable by strong rooted crops like rye and radish. And they will go right through to the B horizon, open it up, and the next crop will reach it and maintain high yields uh, with less tillage. Okay, um, I know I'm uh, right at an hour. Let me a few of the best farms right here in Virginia that have been applying these principles. Um, and just some really creative stuff going on. Just want to take a few more minutes to do this. Um, BABF member Rick Felker and his wife Janice Felter, Felker uh, managed Matt of Woman Creek Farm with a farm crew. It was about 11 acres, uh, four season CSA with some high tunnels. Uh, they have a loamy sand. It is an ultasol, but it is so sandy to begin with that it only has a slightly clay enriched B horizon. So not a whole lot of nutrient holding or um, organic matter holding capacity there. So what he's done is he keeps the crops, he keeps those fields cropped year round. If it's not in vegetables, it's in rye and vegetables in the winter or buckwheat in the summer. Um, he does use a couple of passes with the rototiller to uh, mix the mode cover crop into the topsoil and prepare a seed bed. But he is the one to turn me on to what you can do with the rototiller. He runs the PTO at a low speed rather than full speed. And he moves the tractor faster, two and a half miles an hour rather than one mile per hour, which is typical for rototiller operations. So he ends up just gently mixing those residues in. And even with a very sandy soil, he can see the crumb structure building up. The, the tiller is moving gently enough that it is not smashing soil crumbs. Yeah, it will burn up a little bit of organic matter, but not very much as we'll see in a moment. Um, in the high tunnel, he says, as soon as a crop comes out with that same day, he tills shallow and gets the next crop in. All residues return to the soil where they're grown. Uh, he uses, takes care to use organic fertilizers in moderation to avoid salt buildup and phosphorus imbalances. And the results, his sandy soil has developed that visible crumb structure. The organic matter is now between two and 2.2%. And if you were in Iowa, on a prairie soil, that would be terrible. But here in, in the uh, very sandy soils of coastal Virginia, that is absolutely superb. That means that that soil is as healthy as it can be under the native forest. His fertility has increased so much that he has stopped using um, liquid fish seaweed fertilizer through the season. He needs less and less fertilizer. The soil test phosphorus has remains in optimum range and a high tunnel that has been in 10 years of production with no efforts to leach out the soil is still producing well with no soil problems. And in his words, during our latest phone conversation, he said, the soil just gets better every year. We have excellent growth. All right, uh, this is Pam Dalling. Um, I call this one creative and flexible cover cropping. Uh, she has been working at Twin Oaks Farm uh, for a couple of decades at least. I can't remember, two or, two or maybe 30 years. Uh, growing two acres of mixed vegetables to service a community of about 100 people, keep the kitchen well stocky around. Uh, she has uh, Masada and Tatum loam, uh, fine sandy loam and Tatum silt loam. There is some prior history of erosion. So although these are fairly uh, fertile ultasols as, as the, uh, this type of soil goes, with a very highly enriched uh, clay enriched bee horizon, they're well drained. They are a little bit eroded. They best suffered erosion before Twin Oaks was ever established. Uh, here's one example. She underseeded soybean and oats into sweet corn. Now, the clovers she found didn't work in our climate, but the soybeans do find the heat. They stay in the understory, um, and they're building up the uh, soil organic matter. Um, so she, they developed a 10-year diversified crop rotation that includes one full year in green fallow. And the way she does the green fallow is instead of just underseeding crimson clover, which is an annual into the fall brassica, she uses a mixture of red and white clovers, which are perennials. So those get established while the cut, while the uh, brassicas are, uh, sta are stocking the kitchen with good vegetables. And then uh, the uh, brassicas eventually freeze out in the winter and the clovers grow for all the next year. And she has a number of ways to maximize soil coverage, biomass, and nitrogen fixation. She times her cover crops so that the legumes will flower before it's time to terminate them. Flowering legumes provide the most plant available nitrogen. She's 
become very precise at timing when to undersow a crop, a cover crop into a cash crop for what I call niche sharing. If you plant too early, the cover crop may act as a weed and start interfering with the cash crop or the food crop, I should say, because not, they're not selling there, they're just providing the kitchen. So, and if you plant it too late, the food crop will choke out the cover crop. So you just get it just right. And if you also plant too late, you can, in the shallow tillage required to get the cover crop seed and you can damage some of the uh, food crop roots. She uses winter kill cover crops, oats, soybeans, et cetera, ahead of early spring vegetables. So you have a dead residue, but that's that second best way to keep the soil covered, the dead residues. Uh, she also fills in short gaps with buckwheat for four weeks during the frost-free season or soybean for a six-week gap. Um, and then in the early spring, if there's an eight-week period before you're planning to grow a, a summer vegetable crop, uh, oats is a good, a good choice. So she has contingency plans. Uh, that is, uh, she will sometimes mix a cool season cereal grain with buckwheat or soy for a mid-spring cover crop. Because if you have a cold, damp spring, the buckwheat or soy might fail or might even freeze out, uh, but you still have the cereal grain. Or if you have a hot, dry spring, the cereal grain is going to languish, but the buckwheat or soy will do fine. So um, keeping the bases covered that way, whenever a vegetable crop set, fails or the harvest ends early, she will sow a cover crop, whatever is uh, best for the season. And sometimes that clover green fallow is kind of thin and weedy. So she'll just till shallowly and plant sorghum Sudan at the frost free date or a little later when the soil is warm. This is an amazing cover crop. This is sorghum Sudan grass at full maturity before heading. You cut that down and let it regrow. The roots go even deeper. And this is a, 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 a chamber that uh, the people at, um, this is at a uh, experiment station in North Carolina, but they had a field day on cover crops. Plantus and sorghum sedan in a five foot tall vertical box, its roots went straight to the bottom. Uh, so, um, and the, the soil health outcome, she doesn't have a whole lot of specific data, but uh, production has remained excellent and has kept that kitchen well stocked for uh, decades. So at least sustainable, if not uh, very likely improving year to year. Third one, and most interesting in a way, because it really integrates all six principles, uh, Keen Bell Farm, managed by uh, C.J. Isbell, who was duly awarded the 2020 Virginia Farmer of the Year recognition. He managed his 340 acres in a crop livestock integrated operation. Um, he markets grass-fed beef, pork, pork, poultry, eggs, and some specialty grains, including popcorn, milling corn, and soybeans. Uh, another classic uh, group of soils, or several soil types, but, types, but they're all uh, these highly weathered uh, southern region altosol type soils with a clay B horizon and some history of erosion. So he definitely was starting with less than the best, even though the inherent fertility wasn't too bad. He does use herbicides once to what he calls reset brand new land, which is, ha, has heavy weed pressure, and then switches to completely organic practices. So some of the practices, um, he uses intensive multi-species cover cropping to restore new land. And he grows a succession of winter mixed cover crops and summer mixed cover crops and grazes them. Uh, here's some beef uh, cattle grazing a mature summer cover crop. You can already see the animals for the plants there. And so after two or three years in this kind of rotation, he'll rotate a field to a specialty grain for a market. And then I'll under sow that with clover to uh, maintain um, uh, soil coverage and rebuild nitrogen. Doesn't use tillage. He just seeds, he just drills or broadcasts the seeds depending on moisture conditions. It's rotationally grazed. It's uh, each um, paddock is stocked for one day, rotating uh, so that every 30 to 45 days, he can come back and actually graze the, the same um, annual cover crop again. Here is a field that where it was just grazed down here, about half the biomass was consumed and the other half trampled down, which is thought to be maximal, optimal for building soil organic matter. Um, and here are the cattle now enjoying the new patch of uh, cover crop. He uses pastured poultry and hogs to add diversity and recycle nutrients. 
any of the steeper or highly erodible land is in permanent pasture managed similarly. Um, he is very focused on watershed stewardship, being very close to the Chesapeake um, and close to a body of water that drains directly into it. He does intense soil sampling. He's one of the few people I know of who have applied precision agriculture to organic production systems. He knows where to put down a little extra organic nitrogen or phosphorus to avoid surpluses and runoff. Um, and of course, that intensively uh, rotated um, uh, grazing system will minimize compaction and erosion and runoff. And he set his exclusion fencing at twice the minimum buffer distance to protect all the streams and lakes. So he has a wider than, than uh, um, usual buffer. What are the outcomes? Soil organic matter is nearly doubled, really restored that soil. Uh, nutrient water holding capacity, of course, have increased much less erosion, much less runoff. And then interestingly enough, he had some land that was rented and for whatever reasons, he was not able, it was not feasible to run the livestock there. So he just used a crop only, just the cover crops to restore that soil. It worked, but much more slowly. When you have the cattle in there, the livestock in there grazing down and letting regrow, you're intensively rotational grazing the cover crops, you accelerate the restoration of organic matter. Okay, I'm sorry I took so much time. We still have a little time left for questions. Thank you all so very much. Mark, we have a couple written questions and then we wanted to um, open it up to see if anyone wanted to ask you a question directly by raising their hand and we'll allow them to talk. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Let me get to this one. Um, we have two written questions. The first one is, what are good nitrogen fixing summer cover crops? Ah, good nitrogen fixing cover crops. In our region, uh, I strongly recommend southern pea, uh, otherwise known as cow pea, um, uh, Vigna unguiculata. And the best cover crop variety is called iron clay. It's actually two varieties, iron and clay. Uh, they mature late, so they will flower late, and they will produce a decent amount of viney biomass. You can also grow um, a purple hull crowder or um, black-eyed pea and get a double use where you get a, a food crop and then let mist pods reseed the crop and grow it again. You get a cover crop benefit as well. Um, another one is sun hemp. And this one, it used to be very expensive and hard to get seed, but it's getting more and more available, and more affordable. Sun hemp, if your soil is below par, if it is having a hard time growing forage soybean, which is another great cover crop for good soils, um, but um, the sun hemp, I've seen sun hemp grow normally on soil that was so poor that the soybeans were sickly. And, you know, the sorghum Sudan was pathetic. This is a really poor soil. Sun hemp was up to my shoulders and dark green and fixing nitrogen, just doing it all, you know, and it was like, wow. So um, it has become really popular. I've seen it in um, dozens of different trials of uh, research reports just show that it has the um, capacity to grow lots of biomass, fix one to 100 to 150 pounds of nitrogen, and it rolls down pretty well. And in the spring, you get the, um, uh, I mean, I mean, in the in the fall, you can plant fall uh, crops into it. Uh, good weed comp competitiveness. Uh, so that's a really one to watch. Uh, soybean is good too. You get a good forage soybean. Uh, Hutchison, I think, is pretty good. You want to get a late maturing variety. You want to make sure it's a non-GMO soybean. Uh, what was the one? Oh, Tyrone. If you get a hold of Tyrone soybeans, and you have the even moderately good soil, like you know any of those farmers, your soil is in condition. It could grow great Tyrone soybean. Uh, so those are the three uh, leaders. There are other tropical legumes that may be in the, um, in the coastal regions will do well. Uh, pigeon pea is a possibility. Oh, and another one that's a native is called partridge pea uh, that um, I think Patrick Johnson has recently gotten. Uh, I'm not sure if he received the grant, but I know he's looking for funding to just try it out. It's a it's a native plant and, and uh, it can, uh, it's a really good erosion control. It'll fix some nitrogen as well. So yeah, quite a Thank bit. You, Mark. Yeah. 
Um, this is a com this is a comment from Chris Lawrence, but he would like to hear your thoughts on it. And it's kind of long. I'm just gonna read it, and then um, you can let us know what you think. So both tillage and herbicides are forms of soil disturbance. Right. I propose that a sliding scale is useful when evaluating the trade-offs between them, depending on the site specific. For example, for agronomic crops covering large steep areas mm. that are subject to erosion, risks to the soil from tillage disturbance are amplified. We yeah. risk not only killing soil life, but losing the topsoil altogether in this case. On smaller areas, less vulnerable to erosion, the trade-offs between tillage and herbicides are different. Final note, if site is vulnerable to erosion, that doesn't mean we must use herbicides or synthetic input, but we need to find a way, some way to keep the soil covered, including rotation to perennials, which can involve other significant costs. I'm all for perennializing anything over 5% slope. And I know that some soils are more erodible than others. So you can have a soil at 4% slope that is very resilient to erosion. And you'll have soils at the same slope that'll start washing away in an ordinary thunder shower. So um, very, very, um, very site specific, uh, very situational decision. Um, I agree there are situations that I would rather see the sprayer than the plow, to tell you the truth. However, I still think that, I mean, like what, what um, for instance, what CJ Isabel did, Isabel did is said, okay, I've got some nearly level land, I got some sloping land. Where am I going to grow my grains on my annual forages? On the level. Where am I going to put perennial forage? On the, on the sloping areas. And um, the farm in Kentucky, uh, Elmwood Stock Farm, did the same. I think there needs to be a tremendous expansion in perennial uh, food production systems. Uh, I don't think that in the long run, we want as many acres in the United States growing corn, soy, and wheat. We want more acres in orchard with a proper understory. We want more acres in civil pasture that are producing tree crops of one sort or another and feeding our livestock. Uh, there are perennial grains that are being bred and developed that may be suitable for those sloping areas. Another area that's at moderate risk, let's say it's 5% and is a medium erodible soil, uh, you can do contour buffer strips or you can alternate perennial and annual, you can do alley cropping. Uh, I think that, um, I think Chris's point is well taken and I think that there are many solutions that could reduce in the long run our dependence on herbicides. And by the way, I think our, I, Human health is going to get better if we grow more of these perennial uh, crops and specialty crops and not quite so many acres of corn soy. That's my answer. And I'm not I'm not going to rag at anybody for using a little herbicide, especially if their soil health is obviously responding well to conservation agriculture. I say, you know, cool. And we're just all moving forward. There's no system that's perfect. Thank you, Mark. Um, that's all the typed questions we have. If anybody has a, another question, you can raise your hand and we can allow you to talk to ask Mark directly, or you can feel free to type in any more questions. We have about 10 more minutes. Wow, did I put them all to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. I think that you just did such a good job of explaining everything in depth that we all are very happy. Oh, I see we have one. Raised. Has a question. Let's ask him to unmute here. Hey, this is Chris Lawrence. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, Mark. Good job. And um, thanks for taking my question. Mm -hmm. 
I will just follow up and say that I think in the conventional ag world of soil health, mm -hmm. there is a great lack of focus on the erosion risk. It's almost like we're, we've forgotten the basics that we have to keep the soil in place um, before we can, we can improve the life in it. And I'm, I'm saying that for across all styles. But I wanted to bring up compaction. You didn't mention it as a form of disturbance. I think it's, it's important. Um, any comments on, you know, the risk <clears throat> to soil life uh, and health from compaction? Oh yeah, it's. If you ever been in a stuffy room, uh, you know, moderate compaction is like being in a stuffy room, and bad compaction for soil life is an I can't breathe situation. You know, it's like it'll do to soil life what a bad case of COVID would do to one of us. And yeah, there are ways, uh, I mean, just having traffic, like overgrazing, like when you have that burst of one day intensive grazing, you do get a little bit of compaction, but you get the animals out of there before it becomes serious and you have that rebound, um, too much traffic. And in fact, another way compaction can occur is if you're no-tilling, but you're not growing enough cover crops, like that picture where I had um, the no-till cornfield in the middle of the winter with a moderate amount of residue on it, and it was a bare soil uh, photo, it's like, that's going to sit there and compact. Compaction can occur either by direct force. Compaction can also take place more and more now that we're having extremely heavy rainfalls. Just the force of a terrific rainfall will compact the soil, and it becomes airless. The water doesn't drain out as well. Um, it's just harder for critters like earthworms or even nematodes to get around and do their uh, good work in the soil. I'm talking about beneficial nematodes, like the ones that live on bacteria and fungi and detritus, not the ones that attack plants. Um, but yeah, it's true that you, you really gotta watch that and, and compassion can happen in uh, a number of ways. Another is that, that E horizon I was talking about in a lot of our soils, it's a subsurface form of compaction and simply a lack of deep rooted crops planted at the right time when they can get their roots down through it during a moist spell. Just lacking those deep roots will compact that zone. And so, uh, yeah, that's just as important. Oh, and by the way, erosion, it's a huge factor. In fact, um, I think that somewhere that I, I, I saw that um, something like 5% of total US emissions or world emissions of greenhouse gas can be the carbon loss resulting from soil erosion. Because when the soil, when the wind blows or the rain pounds your soil and starts to wash away, you get um, selective removal of the light stuff, which is the organic matter in the clays. There goes all your fertility, all your carbon. Remember that clays often bind stable organic matter, so they're going to move together. And once that has been moved, if it's blowing around in the air, that carbon just goes to carbon dioxide. If it gets ends up at the bottom of the river or the bottom of the Chesapeake, guess what happens to that carbon? It makes methane. That's 20 times as potent as CO2 as a greenhouse gas. So um, yeah, from a climate viewpoint and of course from a soil health viewpoint, um, erosion is the worst. It's like amputation to in the human health analog, uh, analogy would be amputation. So points well taken. Mark, we have another written question from Anne. Yeah. Yeah. She says, with five to 10 year raised bed rubus crops, has anyone else monitored soil health being undisturbed for long periods as well as biomass accumulation? Oh, this is like under under raspberry, uh, blackberry, rubus. Blackberry. Really good question. Um, it depends on a lot on how the space between the bushes is maintained. If it's just if you're just letting the weeds grow and mow them back so it doesn't hurt your berries, or if you're keeping a good mulch on it. Um, and there are some people who actually go in there and till regularly. If it is even shallow tilled regularly, you're going to get quite a bit of loss. Um, but I would imagine that with either living or mulch cover, you will steadily build up your organic matter. Now, if you're adding large amounts of um, materials, hay, straw, um, 
uh, wood chips or whatever every year to maintain that, you can actually build up some nutrient excesses. You'll build up extremely high organic matter levels, but they will not be the same as carbon sequestered through um, um, plant, plant growth uh, because you've moved the carbon from somewhere else. Um, but I've seen, you know, places that have received heavy amounts of hay mulch will build up potassium to high levels, uh, maybe sometimes too high. Uh, heavy use of wood chips for many years will build up, interestingly enough, to build up calcium. You think of wood chips as acidic, and they are when they when they just come out of the mill. But um, after sitting there for a couple of years, they'll actually alkalize the soil. Um, so if you're putting hard wood chips on your blueberries, check the pH. You might need some sulfur. Um, but it is a good question. I would think that when that is well managed, uh, particularly if you have an orchard or other fruit crop where you're just keeping um, ground cover managed by periodic mowing or periodic raising in an orchard would be great. You know, if, you, if you have a rotationally grazed orchard, you've probably got the win-win-win of um, soil, organic matter and soil health. Uh, Mark, Ann says she's using a fescue cover crop in between and plastic mulch is intact across at least five to seven. Or well, the plastic mulch in the rows? Is that what she was saying? In the rows and then between the rows have the, the fescue? That's what it sounds like. Okay. Um, way I would maybe check, uh, improve on that system maybe is to see if you can get a few clovers or other legumes growing with the fescue. Uh, diversity is turning out to be a huge factor. If you have, like if you have a fescue pasture or if you have a pasture that's a mixture of um, several kinds of grass, several kinds of legume and several kinds of other forbs, even including some that we call weeds like dandelion and chicory and stuff like that, Guess where the cows are healthiest and make the tastiest milk and meat is on that diverse pasture. I just saw um, in a recent um, a soil health conference that I was part of that uh, was given through the National Center for Appropriate Technology. One of the speakers talked about diversity and it's gonna be better for the soil health too. You have a more complete microbiome. Uh, you can do a mow and blow. I would try to get a porous plastic uh, like uh, landscape fabric um, in the uh, crop rows for the uh, for the berries, and then if you do mow and blow, some of the nutrients from the decomposing mulch, the clover grass mix, will work their way down into the uh, root zone, help feed your crop. Another cool trick I saw with uh, that I learned about a few years ago from some growers out west is that if you're using landscape fabric to put down two rows of it, overlapping so that. Uh, each side of your crop row is under a sheet and then you can just pull them back. If you have to add some uh, nutrients, some lime or some sulfur to correct pH, or you want to put a little compost down there to build up the soil or a little bit of a certain nutrient that tested low in a foliar test, you can pull them back, amend, and then cover again. So that's what I was thinking of in that system. Okay, does anyone else have any other questions for Mark? Chris Lawrence has one. Yeah, this is Chris. Mark, I just wanted to say how, what you said about matching the right type of farming, in other words, perennial versus annual crops to the landscape, mm -hmm. that is such a fundamental part of sustainability mm -hmm. that we, we so how often do we hear that? We don't hear it enough. And that was really useful to the way you framed it for me. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to thank you for that as well as everything else. But that is that is the start, right? You don't yeah. you don't plow up the hillsides, no matter what farming style you want to use. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I just want to add one little one to that that I've that I ran into this. There was one research project where they're trying to figure out how to how to amend soils so that they would be favorable for blueberries. They're starting out with alkaline semi-arid soils, not in our region at all. And I go, okay, if your native soil pH is seven and a half, don't try blueberries. If it's five, by all means do blueberries, you know, the, even that kind of thing. And also the type of the type of soil or subsoil, the type of drainage um, can also be taken consideration, you know, in addition to topography.
Okay, last chance to ask Mark a question. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be getting, uh, you'll be receiving the um, the PowerPoint slides and a bunch of um, uh, presentation notes, which will complement and expand on what I was able to say today. And feel free to email if, email me if you have a quick question. You can you can send my email with it. All right, I'll send Mark's email out with the notes, the PowerPoint slides, the recording, and um, that'll be to you guys in the next day. And thank you, Mark, so much. Thank you. All right, glad this worked out.